Hello everybody and welcome for the final CS302 data structure meeting. This is the last class, then we're done with this class, then you take the final, and then you go on and have a wonderful winter break, right? So, what is the purpose of today's meeting? We have two things that I would like to talk about. First and foremost, I would like to review the exam. However, I'm actually going to be doing that at the end of the class. I'd like to take maybe the first 20 or 30 minutes or so of the class to give you a little bit of taste about algorithm analysis and a couple of other things. Now, I, this, this would be a, a really, really long lecture if I actually gave you a lot of that information. So last semester, yeah, it was last semester in spring, I recorded a video on this topic and it was really good. I'm going to welcome you to watch that. I'll put the link in the description below. But uh, if not, then um, at least you'll get a little information of that. So it'll be strictly optional. Only the stuff that I mentioned now will be on the test. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is I actually copied and pasted the notes from that lecture in here. And I'm just going to uh, kind of hit on some points that I would like to bring up, okay? Uh, if you do still have extra credit to redeem, please go ahead and do that and make sure that you tell me on Discord, email, Canvas message, somewhere form, who you are both on Twitch and who you are in real life on Canvas, what your real name is. Otherwise, I don't know who to give the points to. If you don't give me to both of these things, then I can't give you the points. So <clears throat> please do that. After today, there will be no more redemptions. So <clears throat> choose wisely. All right. So... How do I use the 50 also? Just, oh, there you go, you figured it out. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's go ahead and begin. Let's talk, you know, about algorithms. So this is, by the way, this is the uh, the uh, the heading of the old lecture from, from last year, from, from, I guess, May 7th. And again, I, I'll leave the description below, in, in the description below the link to that if you want to see it instead, okay? So that's coming from this. And again, that will be the nice version of this when I actually was fresh with this stuff. So let's talk about algorithms and what an algorithm is. Since we've talked about, you know, this class is called data structures, but really it's a two part class. You learn data structures, but you also learn certain algorithms that handle these data structures, right? I mean, we learn about the graph data structure, but we also learn about like things like dexterous and minimum spanning trees and breadth first search and depth first search and all these things. Or for example, we learn about the tree data structure and the different variations of it, just like an ABL. But these algorithms that are working with the trees, we also talked about such as building the tree or traversing the trees or heaps, that kind of thing, right? Uh, so the class is really two parts, data structures and algorithms. And CS477 will pretty much pick up where we left off. In fact, you'll actually rehash a lot of the things that we covered. Like you might go over some tree stuff and definitely you'll go over all the graph stuff again. And then they will expand and show you more algorithms and kind of look at things as a more of like, as like the meta, like the abstract of everything, you know, you know, instead of just learning an algorithm moving on like we kind of did, you're going to do more analysis, which is why the class is called algorithm analysis. And so that's a little bit of what I kind of want to give you a taste of today. But uh, so anyways, when you think of an algorithm, there are sort of three steps, right? You feed something into the algorithm, then it does some magic in there, the second step, and then the third step is you get hopefully something good out of that, right? And with a data structure, it's basically what you're, how you're holding things in that little mystery box, right? And what those things are is some sort of steps, some rules, some formulas, which is made up of code, like if statements, functions, whatever, right? It's like the big joke about machine learning is all of if statements and whatnot. That's kind of what we're talking about here. So that's really, you know, at a simplified sense, what an algorithm is. If we take, for example, something like a stack, something so very basic, right? Uh, you know, we, our input to the stack is going to be potentially some numbers, some characters, whatever it is. And then they're stored in a certain way. In this case, you know, last in, first out. And then when we take something out, we are getting it in that. So there's that conversion happening. So we could use a stack, for example, to reverse something. Now that's a little bit kind of not that exciting, but, uh, if we think about something like sorting, then that definitely kind of, we, we throw in numbers and then magic happens like quick sort, merge sort, bubble sort, selection sort, insertion sort, heap sort, whatever you want to do. And then bam, it spits out everything sorted, right? And so in general, kind of the, the good too long didn't read of that is that it's basically, a, you know, it's a system of rules, states, and transitions used to convert an input into an acceptable output, right? Well, there's another definition 
that uh, or another uh, concept that shares the same definition as what an algorithm is, and that's a Turing machine. So, what is a Turing machine? A Turing machine is something that you're going to learn about in CS four fifty six, which is the automata class, and it's it's essentially like the OG computers in a way. It's uh, it basically it's used to solve math, math functions and to in the decisive formal language, and it was made by Alan Turing, who is known as one of the fathers of CS in 1936, actually. Now, in 1936, you know, you might not be thinking computers because like computers, we know them today is kind of something that kind of was born in like the 70s or 80s per se. And so what he made, you know, doesn't look like a conventional computer, but it really kind of is where computers kind of came from, you know, the, the way that, that he made his machine. And so the Turing machine is essentially kind of crude drawing of that, which I have up there. It's a machine that has two tapes. You can think of it, or actually it's one tape, but it's, it's kind of like a movie reel where you connect the, 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 here, instead of pointing, I can use the laser pointer. So you got a little reel with a magnetic tape, okay? And then this tape is fed into this reader which then kind of rolls into this other role. So it's kind of like a movie. Imagine this was a movie and it's just kind of rolling through here and you see the image. It's the same thing here, okay? And so how we draw that is we have sort of our input and our input is in the form of symbols. And those symbols, you know, don't worry, you'll learn more about this later on, but they can be, they can represent a lot of things. In fact, pretty much everything. And so when you feed those symbols, then you sort of have these, you know, think, think of graphs now, you know, this is a graph in a way. And so you have all these different vertices, right? And what you're trying to do is get to the accept vertex, okay? So you, you gotta traverse this, this graph right here. And so each the way to traverse this is you have to feed it a certain input in the form of a symbol, and it has to consume that symbol. And so, here, I'm blocking my own image. There we go. So basically, in, in the most basic sense, suppose that I was, you know, that I wanna see if a certain language is, is a, or, or a certain word is part of a language, okay? So suppose that I want to make a machine that can only accept two letters, A and B, okay? But all the A's have to come before all the B's. So I could have, a, I, could, I could send in like an A, A, B. I could send in A, 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 B, 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 B. But I have to put all the A's first and I have to have at least one A and at least one B, okay? So... If I go ahead and say something like A, B, that's okay. A alone, not okay. B alone, not okay. A, B, A, not okay. Pretty much everything has to be a, a, at least one of each and it can be more than one and more than the other one, but they have to be together and they have to be in that order, okay? So if I told you to write a code like that in, in your computer, then um, you could do that with a couple loops and things like that, right? You could probably say something like, uh, you know, a little a loop that runs through the entire input look at, looks at the first character sees if it's an a if it's an a then it's good if not then you already reject the thing and then if it is then you check the second one the second one can be an a or a b but you know if it's a b then it has to um then it has to have a b can i just end there and if you check the b then you can be done but if there if there could be other b's after the first one then you have to check that as well so you have to consume the input so you can keep checking it right so that's kind of what this represents on over here on the right or left, sorry. So this here would signify that. So we have the input. So let's say we're feeding in an AAB, okay? AAB, we're feeding it. So in that case, what is happening is I feed it into the A, I accept the A, and then I go back here because I got a second A, and then I go here for the B, and then I go to what is known as the accept or end state, the happy state. That means that this is part of what will be considered your language. And so this is something simple to basically check whether a certain output is correct. However, it turns out that you can pretty much build one of these machines for any algorithm that you can code in a computer today. It's a little bit more complicated than this when it comes to uh, something as fancy as what we've been doing, but you can definitely do it. And so essentially what these little temporary states are that are depending whether it's A and B, we call those rules, grammars, or steps. And as I said, any computer algorithm uh, that you have, you know, can be basic. You, you can basically build this sort of automata. And that's what this, these little graphs are called. They're called automata. There's deterministic and non-deterministic automata. I believe this would be a deterministic one. Non-deterministic is uh, it's like you can, you can kind of just go through it. You don't have to stop at any of them. It's a little, uh, a little rusty on it, but uh, there is a difference in that. 
And anyways, it, 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 this you will learn in CS456, which is Automata. That's the whole class is pretty much about all this stuff. And so the question that you should ask is, can you solve everything with this? Can you solve any problem with this? And that kind of goes back to the same question is, can we, you know, can we do anything with a computer? Given, a, given like a programming language, can we solve any problem out there? And the answer is that no, we cannot. There are certain things that we can and cannot do with a computer to solve. So I don't hope I'm not breaking anybody's hopes and dreams, but uh, there are certain problems that you cannot solve with current computing. And I'm not just talking about because they're slow, I'm saying that it's impossible to write code that could solve them, even if you had infinite amount of time to solve them. And so this goes back to what is known as a church Turing thesis. And so it says basically that all computers are only as powerful as Turing machines, which means if you can't make a automata that is following the you know, Turing machine that can solve this problem, then you can't do it with code either. Now, what are some examples of, uh, of problems that are like this? I, I kind of mentioned it at some point. I know that I have. I just don't remember when I said it. But uh, it's the greatest problem or like the decision problem. Okay. So, um, or actually, yeah, yeah, they're both the same thing. Yeah. So, what is the decision problem? It's basically an algorithm that uh, can take as an input a statement and then answer yes or no uh, according whether the statement is universally valid or not. Okay. So, kind of read that slowly to yourself and understand what that is saying where we want an algorithm that can take some input and then respond yes or no to see if it's universally valid. And it turns out that you can't do it. And the example that I give, that I give people is what the greatest problem is. If I ask you, th think about compilers, right? A compiler tells you whether code compiles or not, but it doesn't give you whether there's semantic errors or not. So suppose that I said to you, I want you to write a program that can look at any C++ code and simply tell me whether that code is going to terminate or not. And by terminate, I mean that after it runs, then given, well, if it has input, then you know it can be any input that you give it. But the point is, given this circumstances, will the program end? Or will it be stuck in some infinite loop because of bad coding or just because it's just whatever. And it turns out that you can't do it. There is no way to write a program. You can write a program to check a specific instance of that. So suppose that I am giving it out to check whether your uh, your assignment 11 the or whatever the number was for the for the minimum spanning tree assignment that you're working on if all i wanted to know was whether that program was going to close or not because i'm scared of running it in, in, in sally and crashing the server so i just want to know if at least it'll terminate i could do it for that specific instance possibly i could i could cover all my cases and maybe get away with it but what this is asking is a general solution that can apply to all possible combinations like infinite another amount of them potentially because you could write infinite amount of different programs C++. It's as easy as simply saying, see out one number, and then every single number you know that exists, make a program for that, that can see out that number. Already there's infinite of them. So you can see how this is something that would be an insanely amount big thing to check. And that's why compilers don't check for semantic errors, even though it would be really nice if they did. Okay? And so Church and Turing basically kind of figure this out. And what is this known is actually it's a halting problem. And that's the given uh, input for a given program with the program eventually halt when run with that input or will run forever. But the greater problem is also another nickname for that because it's like, you know, can you create a program that can grade students things to see if they so terminate or not? Okay. And um, ignore the sad problem stuff. You can watch the video if you want to see that. Let's skip all of this stuff. And like I said, this is CS456, which is required if you're a CS major. So... Whether you like it or not, you're going to learn about Automata and Turing and the Turing machine. So it's cool stuff, though. Very, very cool stuff. They also talk about pumping lemma and all these other things with languages. Gets, I would say that's the, the most theoretical CS course you will take, which is a really good thing because you get to see what real CS is like, more than just coding, which is, frankly, the it's cool. I, I love coding myself, but there's more to CS. It's what people, you know, it's like what people think of pro see computer science they're like oh it's just programming no there's a lot lot more i mean nowadays machine learning is kind of grown to the point that people recognize it as a as another sort of part of cs but even that they think is just coding there's a lot more to cs than, than just coding trust me on that okay so uh anyways let's go back to talking about algorithms here for a minute <clears throat> so a question to you is what makes an algorithm good? And I would like to see you in the chat 
a couple of suggestions. I have some written here that are the ones that I was given last semester around, but we can compare and see what we got. You can already see the first one, right? A good something that makes an algorithm good is that it's clear and unambiguous, right? It's easy to read, easy to understand what is happening, right? It's kind of important. I mean, you could say that this algorithm like is so amazing, it like I don't know, it just it just like uh, cures cures all diseases. But if nobody knows how it works, then can you really trust it? Okay, I like that one. This is a good one. Efficient and fast. So going back to space and time complexity, right? We want it to be fast. We don't want to have the bubble sort running to sort numbers, you know, when we're kind of in a rush and there's better things, right? So more than saying something like n log n or something, we're saying we an algorithm is made good because it's fast and efficient. Efficient and fast kind of go together because if something is not fast and it's probably not efficient, however, there are algorithms that are efficient but are still very, very slow, right? So in general, we just want things to be fast. That's a very good one too. We want an algorithm that does not make mistakes. And there are algorithms out there to solve problems that do make mistakes. Those are known as heuristics and I was gonna talk about them soon. But there's algorithms that essentially are, you know, we sacrifice accuracy for what is essentially speed. Sometimes, we are okay if an algorithm guesses 98% of the time correct, even if the other 2% is wrong. We accept that over having to wait a lifetime for a, for, for a solution that is 100% correct. So yes, it's very important that an algorithm is good and performs without errors, right? All right, I, I like those two. I, I, I really do like the one with that performs without errors. I don't think people uh, caught on that last time around, so I'm going to go ahead and write that down. Any, any other ones you want to throw in there? I mean, we got fast, efficient, uh, performs without errors. I kind of already mentioned it, clear, readable, I would say is something important, right? I mean, it's 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 useless if an algorithm is unreadable at this point. And that, but that's more of like an implementation point of view than versus the algorithm, right? Okay, let's go ahead and see what I have here. I actually don't remember some of the things that were here, but yeah. So, clear and ambiguous. Well documented. I like that one because, again, it's it's useless to have an algorithm that nobody knows how it works because then we can't fix it or modify it if we need to apply it to a special problem where you have problems with it. And so, as you see here, well-defined inputs and outputs is also kind of documentation, right? We want to make sure that we know exactly what this algorithm is for, what we expect to get out of this algorithm, and what we need to put in exactly. Because if we don't, then we're not going to be able to take advantage of it. It has to be feasible as well. All right, and by feasible again, it has to be something that can finish, you know, hopefully fast, but that at least it can finish. And then space that it, it, it is, you know, feasible within our, our memory available, you know, the less space better, but uh, at the end of the day, at least that it's, it's not infinite space, otherwise we're screwed, right? And then I have this little plus one, it's kind of like a nice thing is that it's language independent. Now, what does that mean? If I tell you, you know, a lot of these algorithms that I told you about, I didn't necessarily show you code in C++ for, or any code at all, right? So when I told you like Dijkstra's, you know, I did not write a single line of code. I wrote some pseudocode, but I did not write a single line of code. That's because an algorithm should be language independent. It, a, and not all algorithms are sometimes because what language independent means is that the, it's an idea that you're getting and then you can apply it to any programming language that you want. And you're not limited to a certain group of them. Some algorithms are not like that. Some algorithms require like, for example, functional programming kind of stuff or, uh, or, or like multi-paradigm programming with like with like a, like a, the process J, like that kind of stuff. There are certain algorithms that only work for certain kind of programming languages. While, you know, that's okay, it, it ideally we would want an algorithm that can work for any programming language. You want to code it in Python, Java, PHP, bless you, or uh, anything, then uh, you can do it. That is another important thing that makes it more strong. You know, you can co code bubble sort in just about any programming language you want, right? I guess that's a plus for bubble sort. So yes, can we apply to any coding language? That's kind of, yes, what we're saying. All right, so let's talk about some of the algorithms that we learned. And I would normally ask you, but I'm just gonna list them out so we can go fast. So we talked about sorting, you know, we got, these are all to, told by people last time around, but I mean, I think that's pretty much what we covered. We did that for search, quick sort, you know, minimum spanning trees, Dijkstra's, more sorts, traversals, heaps, bubble sort. Uh, we didn't do any bucket or radix sorts this time around, so don't worry about that one. In fact, let's just kind of, slowly hide it away from existence but uh yeah the other ones we did though i don't remember why you had a little triangle there though big mystery maybe we're talking about heaps but yeah so these are some of the algorithms that we learned so now let's kind of look at this list and see 
what are some of the similarities and differences that you could say about these? I mean, of course, bubble sort and quick sort, the similarities are they're like they're for sorting, you know. But more than that, let's see if there's a there's a pattern that they share, something that like, you know, you would say that that that, that you could say there's a connection between something like that first surge and the traversals for trees and maybe something like quicksort like what are some of these similarities that you could kind of think about that some of these have or with the graphing ones whenever we do something like that first surge and dextrose there's some similarities there too in fact when you when you were in 135 they even talked about some of these things that you want to have in a, in, a, in a program when you're trying to solve a problem so can anybody think of any sort of similarities that they have let me give you one let's talk well, I mean some of them have recursion of course so recursion is something that's similar but but more of like a, a generic sort of thing let's think about Dijkstra and let's think about something like death first search and let's think about something like traversals and even something as quicksort. We have this idea that we kind of go somewhere and then we go back, right? In the sense of that first search, you know, when we when we reach somewhere, we can't keep going further, we come back to the previous no. When we, we're doing something like sorting, when we finish sort, sorting a piece, we kind of go back to the other piece. When we do something like, um, like traversals, you know, we reach a leaf node, we come back, right? And we're doing this thanks to the recursion, but in general also because it's part of the algorithm, right? So there's this sort of concept of things like backtracking that is useful for algorithms. Another thing that's kind of useful for uh, for algorithms, which I did talk about last class, was dynamic programming, right? I think I, I did, right? I hope I did talk about dynamic programming last class. And so dynamic programming is the idea of remembering things, memoization for Python, remembering outputs so that we don't have to recompute them again. Uh, Dijkstra uses that. Some algorithms that we haven't talked about that do use as things like Lippenstein's edit distance. Uh, but pretty much you can do Fibonacci with dynamic programming. There's a lot of different algorithms that share this sort of idea of remembering so you save time. On the other hand, we have things that are greedy. So algorithms that just kind of really hit in an area before giving up and trying something else instead of trying to even things out equally. So like something like a death first search. Uh, there's and so, and there's of course the most popular one, 135, is things like divide and conquer, right? So the idea of taking a problem and splitting it into smaller pieces. We've seen this with a lot of algorithms, for example, the sorting ones, like things like merge sort is a perfect example of divide and conquer. But even things like quick sort use it a bit. Um, when we're doing things like heaps, you know, when you're doing the heap part and you're and you're bubble, you know, you're heapifying, you're doing it in the tiny pieces of the heap, right? Maybe, maybe that's how I came up with that triangle last time around. So you're doing this part of the heap, then this part, and then this part, and then you do the whole thing like that. You're doing tiny pieces and kind of chipping away at a problem, right? That's the idea of dividing a problem into smaller subsets and conquering it, right? So, some dependent trees while other dependent data structures. Eh, that's okay. So essentially, there's a lot of these sort of shared sort of uh, approaches to solving a problem. And so that's what I want to talk about with the different kinds of algorithms that we have out there. Okay, and so there's a these are called algorithm design techniques, and it's good to uh, to kind of pick up on this because you can apply them to solve your own problems and to develop your own algorithms if you ever choose to do so. So greedy, as I said, are algorithms that are are typically not very efficient, but very easy to implement, and they usually involve just going hard and trying as deep as possible. So things like death first search. Um, or any of the traversals, of course. Um, what, um, merge sort, in a way, is a little bit greedy because you keep splitting until you get to the end. What else can we think about? In a way, a little, I mean, a little bit, th these don't have to be, by the way, um, unique. Like, you can't have something that's only greedy or only this. They can be shared. So even you could see something like the way that you bubble things in something in keep sort is greedy in a way because you just keep going in until you can't do it anymore, right? However, a lot of the times, greedy algorithms are not very time efficient, okay? Because they just, they, they, they're they not that complex. We also have things like dynamic programming, which I said is the ones with memorization. And uh, those are very efficient algorithms, but they typically tend to have more space involved. You can take, make a lot of, of, of algorithms dynamic, um, not dynamic, well, the dynamic programming, dynamic, you can think of like dynamic memory allocation, so don't get confused with that. 
And uh, the advantage that you get with that is speed at the cost of space, which is sometimes an acceptable trade-off. Divide and conquer, as I said, is to breaking a problem into smaller pieces, and it's a very useful thing to do, not just in specific algorithms, but you're trying to solve a problem in general. You know, don't try to approach the entire thing, you know, chip away at different, at different things and solve them individually and then put them together, right? Backtracking is, uh, is a lot of the times when you, when you finish something, what you were trying to achieve was actually from the beginning to the end or from the end to the beginning. So things like Dijkstra's. Dijkstra gives you the shortest path from a source node to all nodes. But if what you were trying to find is a path from the end node to the, first, to the, to the start node, you don't do Dijkstra from end to start, you do from start to end. And so this idea of backtracking is there. Also with greedy algorithms like the traversals, you're backtracking up a node, that is backtracking as well. So you're going back, typically achieved with recursion and things like that. Some of the other ones that we don't really do a lot are things like randomized. So randomized algorithms take advantage of just the concept of randomization to speed things up. The only real example that we saw with that is quicksort. When quicksort, we picked the pivot and ran randomly, right? Well, we technically pick, picked it as the last number, but that's technically random because we don't know what number is gonna be there. And it turns out that that's one of the most efficient ways to do the pivot selection. And uh, so sometimes random is good. And so that can be applied to a lot of different algorithms to do uh, randomization and things like that. Heuristics, as I was saying a, a little bit earlier, is the idea that some algorithms take a long time. And so sometimes it's better to have algorithms that take a lot less time, but are not always accurate, but we do what's called an educated guess, than an algorithm that is really, really slow. And so as the question says there, why would I do that? Why don't I just make an algorithm that is faster instead of doing one with guesses? Well, again, some of these algorithms you can't out achieve in, uh, in a decent amount of time. We didn't talk about A star this time around. I did talk about it last semester. It's basically, you think about like Dijkstra, but the, the only difference being that you add in a, a, a heuristic actually, which is an extra value that tells you whether you're closer to your goal or not based on the direction that you're going. And then that's pretty much what A star is, is modified Dijkstra. So you can watch my videos last time around or uh, just Google it essentially. But that's an example of a, of a heuristic algorithm. Uh, but there are many. And so, what is, it's like an interesting glare. This comes, this brings me up to talking about P versus NP problems, okay? And so, you might have heard jokes like, oh, this is NP complete, you know, you're going to be here forever kind of thing. And it turns out that a lot of these problems in computer science can be split into different categories, or at least we think that they can be split. This is something that we're not 100% sure of. The whole concept of P versus NP is not something that has been proven to be true or false, but most people think that they are indeed going to be different categories. So what is P versus NP? So P are, are a set of problems that can be solved with a Turing machine, which I was just talking about, in polynomial time. Now, what does polynomial time mean? That can be something like uh, N squared, N cubed, uh, 2N, log N, all of these numbers, but not exponential time, okay? Or, or something bigger than that. We don't like those. Those take a long, long time. Already N squared is pretty inefficient, but some algorithms are N cubed and, you know, we, we deal with it. But things bigger than that is kind of, uh, especially when you get to exponentials where it doesn't really matter, it just grows insane. I'm talking about instead of saying N squared, something like two to the N. If we have an algorithm that takes two to the N, it's over. You're gonna die before this thing even finishes. Like even, not even finishes, even makes progress, okay? And so that category of algorithms that are not polynomial, uh, we, we call them, uh, well, non-polynomial is actually kind of a, uh, I was gonna say that, it's, it's not a very good term to use because what MP actually stands for is non-deterministic in polynomial time. And that means that you cannot determine an answer in polynomial time, which means it can take more than, it's gonna take a different sort of time, like exponential time or other things. And so we claim that the polynomial algorithms are subsets of non-deterministic polynomial time algorithms. The question is this, if we have a problem that we can't, that, that is non-deterministic in polynomial time, so it's NP, and it's a problem that we can't solve in polynomial time, and that the shortest, fastest algorithm we have takes two to the N power, for example, is that just because we suck? Like we're not good at making solutions? Like we can't make it, like there's a better solution out there but we don't know it yet? Or is there really no better solution out there? You know, if I go out and tell you, yo, I have this really cool algorithm, it takes N squared time to do. And then I tell you that's the fastest you can do. And then I ask, okay, are you sure that's the fastest or is that the fastest that you can solve it? And then 10 years from now, somebody's gonna be able to solve it in like N log N time. 
You know, can you theoretically prove to me that that is really the fastest you can do? And so this is the big debate between P versus NP. We have a lot of these problems that cannot be solved in polynomial time and that we think that are not possible to be solved in polynomial time. We're not saying that we haven't found an algorithm and we'll find a future. We're saying there doesn't exist an algorithm that can be found. And because of this sort of debate about whether it's, you know, we're not good enough or it really doesn't exist, is the question about whether P is equal to NP. We just haven't figured out the solution yet. Most people that are educated in the area tend to side with the fact that P is not equal to NP, that there is indeed really this set of problems that really cannot be solved. But we go even further than this. We can split these categories into more than just two, P and NP. We have also what is known as NP complete problems and NP hard problems, okay? So, um, NP, NP, uh, NP, NP complete problems are really, really interesting because here's the thing about them. Well, we can't solve them in polynomial time, like we can't, we don't have an algorithm to solve them. We can verify a solution in polynomial time. So what this is saying is, is that there's a problem that is going to take exponential time for me to solve. However, if by luck, I actually have a solution to this problem, I can check it super fast. It's like super, super fast. Okay. And so this is kind of mind boggling a little bit like, okay, I can check a solution really fast, but I can't solve the general solution. And yes, this is the case. It turns out that, uh, this is where heuristics really come into play because heuristics can try to give you some guesses, which then you can manually check and see like, Hey, does this kind of work or does this not work? However, if you say, well, why don't I just mix heuristics and checking? Well, technically speaking, your heuristics could always give you a wrong answer and then you'd be screwed. So that's why we don't say, oh, well, we can work around this NP situation by uh, using a mixture of heuristics and verifying. So NP complete problems are really cool. They're like, they're like the teasers, you know, they tease us because they're like, we, you can't solve us, but if you, um, if you do have a solution that you guessed correctly or somehow you got, you can check and see if it actually is a solution or not very, very fast. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you an example of one of those, which is going to be the knack problem. Okay, uh, there's also NP hard problems that uh, are even more like question mark, question mark, because they're like, they may or may not be verifiable in polynomial time. So those are like, not only can we not solve it in polynomial time, but we can't even verify. So that's like, that's like even harder than complete. That's just like, you know, you just can't do it. Can't do anything about it. Okay. They're just not solvable. Okay. And we would say that uh, they're at least as hard as NP complete problems, but probably more harder than that. And so here's a little graph of what that looks like in, in terms of categories. Okay, so we got there in the blue in the little in the dotted circle is basically CS302 right there. CS302 right there living in that land. And we have things like Dijkstra, you know, uh, pretty much any algorithm that we did, sorting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Now in this big world of computer science, there are other things. We have the NP, which is this category. We also have the NP hard. We have a shared set of them, which is things like NP complete, which is what I'm going to talk about with the NACSAC. We have things like decision problems here. And then uh, pretty much anything else here. Like it's just, these are all kind of theoretical. We don't really know. This could all be the same thing. And we're just not, you know, it's just one ball, but we haven't figured out why, how, where, what. So, you know, it's uh, it's kind of a big thing. And there, there's another thing. People say there might be an infinite hierarchy of these. Like there could be like NP hard, NP harder, NP hardest, NP hard, 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 hardest. Like we don't know. This stuff is pretty new. We don't know what's going to happen in 50 years from now, how things will change. But we think that if anything, we're going to keep splitting this into different tiers. They're not going to merge. That's what we think. Or at least what people that are, are, are into this thing think. Okay. So uh, that's pretty much all the stuff that uh, that I talk about there. And so before I talk to you about the uh, reductions, let's talk about what the NACSAC problem is, okay? The NACSAC problem is a really easy problem to, to kind of think about, but it's, it's, so it's a nice one. And they're, they're, they're gonna, this is one of the, actually one of the algorithms that you are gonna learn in, uh, in 477 and uh, maybe code, I don't know if they make you code it. But uh, yeah, so think about this. I really wish I had some visuals for this. I could have done it, but oh well, too late. Suppose you have a backpack, okay? Or an, I guess that's what a knapsack is. So, and uh, you have a certain dimension of what you can fit in there, okay? And then, um, you know, you, 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 uh, you're going to, why do I use money here? Okay, the only thing I can think of is you're, 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 you know, bad things happened, 
you're trying to get out of your house as quickly as possible, okay? I don't know why, but maybe like, like a meteor is falling or something, okay? And so, ah, I see now, yeah. So, 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 so in the backpack, you have a limited amount of volume to store things, okay? And you're trying to store things that are like worth the most amount of money. So you have, in, the, in terms of dimension, you have this, uh, or let's do weight. Let's just say weight instead of dimension, okay? So your backpack can carry 20 kilos of, uh, of stuff. And so you can either carry toilet paper, which is one kilo each. It's only worth $100 in this post-apocalyptic world. You can also have carry gold, but gold is heavier. It weighs five kilos, but it's worth $700. And then I guess I had their anime, I guess because the anime people, but let's just do something. Let's say you have a, a CPU or something, okay? But the CPU is the heaviest, but it's worth the most. The question is, how can you maximize the backpack? So, you know, go and use as much weight as possible, but also, more importantly, carry the most valuable items, okay? So an easy solution that you might think is, well, you know, I could try going with the heaviest value item first, and then like the, you know, the least heaviest and then kind of top it off. It turns out that it's not as easy as this, okay? You, uh, you can't solve it like that in a quick manner. You have to try a lot of different things and it turns out that you can't even do this in polynomial time. You can't solve this problem. Something as simple as this. I have a backpack, I got all these different items. I'm trying to maximize the amount of value that I can carry in the backpack that fits in there and I can carry it, okay? You ideally want to fit in the most valuable things, but you know, it turns out that here the toilet paper and the and the one is worth eight is actually about the same. You know, you could you could put eight of those, you could put one of those, right? But if you got the five here, if we're trying to maximize it with twenty, then you might be better off putting four of the seven hundreds instead of the eight hundreds, right? Because two of the eight hundreds would be sixteen, and then you can't fit the gold in there, right? So what I'm saying is, let's call this A, T, and G. So if we got twenty as our limit, we try doing two go two of the A's, we have sixteen then we can't really fit uh, the five of the gold. So essentially we would have to feed four of the toilet papers, okay? Alternatively, we could fit in four of the Gs and this would basically be four times seven. That's uh, 30, 28. And then in this method here, we have two of those, which is 1600 plus four, which is 20. So this one has 20 hundred. So you can see that the, the, the five goals is a better is a better solution for this. So it's not always the case that you just have to use the largest items. It's, it's, it's tricky. You have to test out all these different cases. So it's not polynomial. However, if I was to give you a solution for this and I said, hey, here's the perfect combination of the box you need. You could test it and you can see that, wow, this is this, this, uh, it's actually like the most efficient, like there's, I, I can't figure out a better way. You could test it very easily to see if that is the answer. Assuming that you, the answer is, the, you know, the computer knew the answer, you offer that answer and it's like, yeah, that's correct. So you can verify a solution in constant time practically, or polynomial time at least, but you can't come up with a solution in polynomial time, okay? So um, don't worry about the substance sum problem. And then we have the Boolean satisfiability problem. That's, uh, yeah, we can talk about that one really fast. So it turns out that uh, when you're trying to figure out whether a problem is NP complete, the easiest way to do it is to convert it into something that you already have known that is considered to be NP complete. And it turns out that the, that the Boolean satisfiability problem known as the SAP problem is a good example of that. The SAP problem is essentially, uh, I'll, t well, I'll tell you what it is in a second, but uh, people have said, look, we think that the SAP problem is part of the NP complete class. And uh, if you can solve the SAP problem, then you can solve all these other problems. So we'll just leave it at that. So we're making an assumption that SAP is part of NP. And now if we can convert any problem that we have that we think is also NP complete in polynomial time, do a, com do a transformation that takes polynomial time. If we can do that to another problem and convert it into the SAP problem, then we can say that the other problem is also part of the NP complete class. That is what is known as reduction. So in this case, you can actually convert the knapsack problem into the SAP problem using as a reduction the subset of some problem. I'm not going to talk about that one, but I did talk about it in my other video last year, so you can check that out. But again, those reductions have to take polynomial time. They can't take non-determinist polynomial time because then I could take any problem and then convert it into the SAP problem. Okay. So what is the SAP problem? The SAP problem is another easy one too. 
And, th and it's a really good example of how to test whether something works or not, uh, simply. So what the SAP problem is saying is, given a certain sort of Boolean algebra expression, such as here you have if A and B or not A, and B or C and B and not C, you have a little expression there, okay? So if I were to ask you, what values for A, B, and C could I have in, uh, in this expression so that it can evaluate the if statement to true? If I asked you that, you would have, and you wanted to solve it, you probably just start guessing values. Like, okay, well, let me try A true and uh, B true and then C true, or maybe C false. Turns out there's two solutions for it, I think. Those are the ones here that I have here, TTF and FTF. However, creating an algorithm that can solve all of these solutions, you know, give you, give you the exhaustive solution, is not something you can achieve in polynomial time. I'm not like snapping away out of existence here. So, however, if somebody wants to tell you a potential solution for the problem, such as if I tell you, well, try out TTF and see if it works, you can solve it in very fast constant time. In fact, let's try it out. Let's see if TTF is indeed an answer. Well, all right. So let me uh, copy paste this beneath it. Oops, that's not what I meant to do, but it still works. All right, so let's go ahead and replace true, 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 false, true, false, right? So this becomes true and true, that's true, okay. And then true or whatever doesn't matter. So um, however, this is not true. So that's true or false, that's okay, whatever. It still becomes true. And then, so that takes care of this part. This part is an R statement, so B can be true, so that's okay as well. And then we end those together, true and true is okay. So we're, we still have true and then we have left this. So you have true and true and not true, which would be true. So that is, or uh, not false, sorry, which would be true. So yes, that is indeed a correct solution. That was fast. I just plug it in and good to go. However, coming up with that solution, can't do it in polynomial time. You're gonna have exponential time to figure this out. Don't believe me? It's a fun way to spend this winter break. Plus, hey, if you figure this out in polynomial time, you just prove P versus NP, and you, there's some wars that have millions of dollars associated to it if you can prove it. So it would be a useful way of spending your winter break, but also pretty stressful, because it would take quite a while to figure out if you got it right or wrong. So uh, I don't know why I'm having the weird, I'm like disappearing here, okay. So uh, that's what the satisfiability problem is. And essentially, if you can convert something like knapsack into this, which you can, you can, you can basically do, you know, you have to know what the uh, subset sum is to basically to convert it. But then uh, you can basically convert something as complicated as backpack sorting into a SAT thing. And there's different levels of SAT as well. So uh, yeah, okay. So that's pretty much uh, an introduction into not just uh, algorithms, but a little bit of automata, a little bit about P versus NP. So now you know when somebody tells you that something takes NP time to complete, that's when you're like, oh boy, that's when you actually wanna use something like a heuristic. And educated guess, you can do algorithms that can be done in polynomial time for NP problems. However, they're gonna be probably using a heuristic, which is an educated guess. And that's okay because you can always verify your educated guesses. And also, you know, 98% might be good enough for your job. However, if you want full accuracy in an NP problem, then be ready to wait a long time for it to finish. And so that's the very compressed version of what that lecture is. But I welcome you to watch that lecture if you wanna know more about that. Uh, and again, you will learn more about these topics when you take in 477, 456, and even when you take a little bit of compilers too. So that's it. That is the end of the material for the semester. And so now, all that remains is the test. And so, time for the review, okay? So, for the review, I don't have anything. I mean, I'm gonna open it up for questions. What I can tell you is, it's a comprehensive exam. You can expect to see questions more focused towards the latter material that you have not been tested on. So you can expect to see a Dijkstra question. You can expect to see a minimum spanning tree question where you can choose which algorithm you're gonna do, but you have to choose one of them. You can expect pretty much something related to breadth first search or depth first search. Probably not both because of time, but uh, maybe I'll do random. So some of you get depth first and some of you get breadth first. So you get to do that algorithm as well. And then uh, maybe something to do with the JCC matrices or, or, or uh, lists. And then 
from the rest of the semester, you will, I, I almost guarantee you that you are going to see an ABL question, a recurrence relation, and maybe a sorting question. Because those are the big, oh, and a tree question too, probably. But that's kind of ABL, so it'll probably be shared. I think that's going to be kind of bring up the limit. So Dijkstra, minimum spanning tree, DFS or BFS, ABL, recurrence relation, and then maybe a sorting question. I think that is gonna pretty much put you to the limit of the time. There is, however, we do have two hours for the exam um, officially. So that does give me more flexibility with the duration of the exam to make it a little bit longer. And uh, for this class, you have the exam on Monday, whether which section you are, doesn't matter, it's on Monday. The only difference is technically it would be from one to three for one section and from, I think from three to five to the other section, if I recall correctly. So uh, we're just going to make it from one to five. You can take it uh, whenever you want, but you still only have the two hours. Okay. All right. So having said that, I am now opening the floor for questions and I have already received the first question to talk about. And that is, can we go over minimum spanning trees? Okay. So last class, we, we kind of went over a little bit and I did post the video for you to watch um, over the weekend. But uh, I can definitely go over minimum spanning trees again. Is there a preference that you have between cross goals, prims, or just in general minimum spanning trees? Is there anything specific you want me to touch on? Just, just tell me that and I'll go over it. Can you show us how to quickly finish an ABL tree with rotations? I can show you an example of ABL trees for sure. So I'll put that here. ABLs. Is there going to be a study guide like exam one? Uh, probably not because... Um, like I don't have a, a like a PDF, so really it's just gonna be based on this. That's pretty much it. Um, okay, so prims. So you want to do prims? Okay. So prims is actually the one that's really really close to Dijkstra's. So uh, we're, we'll go ahead and do an example of that. Okay. All right. So we got a couple of things in here. If you uh, uh, have, uh, you only want to you can choose whichever algorithm you want to use for the exam. So if you want to use cross code, you can. If you want to use prims, you can. I made you have that choice this time around. Last time I asked both, but uh, this time I chose like whatever. You're going to learn either one again in, in uh, 477. So I'm not too concerned about you not knowing both of them this time around. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the prim. Let me just go ahead and come up with a random graph. And then uh, we'll do it. I'm not going to make the graph too big because otherwise we'll be here all night. So um, maybe we'll leave it at that. Okay. And then we're going to do a couple of connections. Like that. Okay. And let's go ahead and throw in some weights to this. So. Okay, so we got ourselves a couple of weights. Could you not make the exam tree not too big as well? <laughs> I shall try. Oh yeah, you might actually also get a build a tree question as one well, as well. All right, so let's go ahead and name our nodes um, with letters this time around. It's easier to keep track of them. Okay, and so with prim, what you want to make sure you have ready to go is your little chart, right? Same with Dijkstra. I'm warning you, don't get those two algorithms mixed. I mean, heck, I probably screwed up a few times. Remember when, we do, when I was doing it in class? You want to make sure you don't get the thing mixed. Let me just put it on the next page so the, the line is not there from the page division. Just make sure you don't, you don't get them mixed up, okay? Don't get Dijkstra's and Prim's mixed up. So what you want to have with prim is going to be the vertex name, the weight, which I'm going to call key, the pointer to the parent, and then your visited array. It's just booleans, okay? You want to have a, a column for each letter, essentially. So we got five, so we're going to have five columns. They're not very straight, but I'm kind of just trying to get it quickly done. Okay, so we got A, B, C, D, E, and then uh, 
we're gonna set the we're gonna leave everything blank for now okay i mean technically we we got these at infinities you know but uh i'll put infinity why not okay so with prims you gotta pick arbitrarily just pick a node to start from and the test will tell you which node to start from so that your answer matches the you know so the tas only have to like figure out fifty thousand different variations of the algorithm so uh let's just go ahead and start with um I'm trying to see what would be a good choice. Yeah, A. We're going to pick A because I want to see some, some action. Okay? So uh, when you have A, it doesn't really have a parent because you're starting there. And we're going to mark it as visited because we're going to be done afterwards. And so what you want to do here is set it to zero for that one that you're starting with. Okay? All right. So now we're going to look at all the edges coming out of A. We have three of them. We have A to E, A to B, and A to C. And we are going to update those weights if they are smaller than what we currently have. Because this is prim and not Dijkstra, we're not adding it anything. We're just checking that weight. So they're all going to be updated because they're all set to infinity. So C, B, and E are all going to have something less than infinity now. B is going to have an eight because there's an eight with you know value here, and then C is going to have a one, and E is going to have a ten. Okay, cool. There's no more edges to look at, so we can consider ourselves to be done with this step. Next, we're going to look at the smallest, smallest value on the key and use that as the next vertex to work with. So that would be for us the C value, because that's the one, okay? So that would be the next vertex to work with. So looking at vertex C, we have three edges coming out of it. So the edge coming from C to A is going to a vertex that we already marked as visited. Therefore, we don't want to mess with that. We don't want to touch that. We want to move on. So just ignore that. Okay, so we got to leave us with two other uh, two other edges, C to B with a weight of three, and then C to D with a weight of seven. In this case, let's start out with the C to B. Okay, with C to B, we can see that there's a weight of seven, of three, which is smaller than the eight that we have here because it's smaller. Oh, by the way, apologies, I forgot to put the source parents in this. This would both be A's. That's where they came from, okay? I apologize for that, okay? So we're looking at C to B and we see that C to B is three. We currently have an eight here. Three is smaller than eight, therefore we want to update it. So instead of having the eight there, we're gonna have a three. And instead of saying that this is coming from A, it's no longer coming from A. It is actually coming from C. So we put a C there, okay? So that takes care of that one. We got one more edge to look at, that's C to D. These currently infinity, so seven is going to be smaller than infinity, so we are going to update that. Okay? Alright, we're done with C. Check it as done. Move on. Now we got B, D, and E. We're gonna pick the one with the lowest weight. The lowest weight being this one, the three here. So we're gonna go and work with that. Okay. So B has a lot of edges coming out of it. It actually has four edges. It has this one, this one, and then the two others that are highlighted, right? The fact that two of them are highlighted means that we already visited A and C. As you can see, the visited array is marked as check as then, so we don't have to worry about those two edges. The only edges that we have to worry about are the ones going to unvisited nodes, which in this case are echo and delta. So those are going to be, let me go ahead and write them out for you here on the side so you get confused. It's going from B to E and then going from B to D. Okay, B to E has a weight of three, and then B to D has a weight of two in it. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at B to E. E has currently value of 10. Three is smaller than 10. So we are not going to, you know, keep that 10. We're going to update it and put a three there. And we're going to change to say that we're no longer coming from A, we're coming from B. All right, that takes care of this one. Let's look at the next one, B to D. D has a seven, two is smaller than seven, so we're gonna update that as well. So we're gonna change this from C to come to B. And now we are done with B, so mark it as done. All right, moving on, we have uh, D and E. D is the smaller one, because it has a, a key weight of two. So we're gonna work with D now. D has three edges coming out of it, this one and then the other two. As you can see, the, the, way the edges coming to B and C are both marked as done. So we don't have to worry about it. So the only edge we have to worry about is this one, B, uh, D, to, D to E. So um, D to E is eight, but we have a three here. It, three is smaller than eight, so we're not gonna update. So nothing really happens here, and we just mark that as done. Just like with uh, Dijkstra's, when you have only one vertex left to visit, 
it means you're already done. But just, just if you want to play it extra safe, you can go look at it. You can see that E has three edges coming out of it, but they're all going to vertices that I've already marked as visited. Therefore, nothing would be able to be updated. No, you have finished. So now you ask yourself, okay, I finished. Now, how do I draw the, the minimum span entry? Well, not to worry. What you do is you are going to basically take your graph And you're only going to draw the edges that I'm about to show you here. Okay? So the only edges that you're going to draw are the ones from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and then from here to nothing. So there's nothing drawn in that one. Okay? So, first one it says E to B. So, E to B. Now, what weight does that have? That's a three in it. So just put a three. Next one, D to B. What's the weight on that one? Two. Next one, C to A. What's the weight on that one? One. So I'm looking at it right there. All right, last one, B to C. Weight of that one? Three. And I am basically done at this point. As you can see, this would have been the minimum spanning tree. The minimum spanning tree is always going to have the lowest possible summation of edges together, uh, the weight of the edges together. As you can see, this is 3 plus 2 plus 3 is going to be 6 plus, well, well 3 plus 6 plus 6. Apologies for that. 9. It's 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 9. I was thinking ahead of my head. Uh, so, yeah, that is, of course, you can't. Do you cannot do anything with uh, with other weights because if you notice all the all the edges that are gone are like the heavy ones. We got a ten that is gone, an eight that is gone, the other eight is gone, the seven is gone. If we try to replace any of these with those, we would end up with a bigger number if you add everything together. So this is indeed visually, it just looks like it's correct. But again, we don't trust our eyes, especially if you no, know, this graph is you know four, five vertices, whatever. But if that was one billion vertices, you wouldn't be able to just see it and see the answer. I mean, unless unless you're lying gifted like that which you might be but i'm just saying i can't do it so i'm extrapolating at this point okay so um all right any questions about prim or minimum spanning trees in general before we move on Let's see what's next abls was next i guess is that what you guys are next yeah abl tree with rotations is it possible for a graph to be directed when we are asked for a minimum span entry? Uh, yes, it can. You just you just modify it by thinking of that as an edge existing there or not, and you just want to you, you want to make sure that you care about the direction of the arrows, okay? When that they're incoming to the vertex you're looking at, otherwise it doesn't really work, okay? But uh, I, I will tell you that in the test I will not do that. You know I don't want to throw a curveball at you. They will be undirected. Okay. The only one that might have directed one is like maybe like the like uh, like the DFS or BFS. Maybe I'll do directed in that one, but uh, I don't even think I will for that. Again, you're gonna look at more exciting examples when you get to automata. Sorry, automata algorithms class. Okay, let's go and talk about ABLs then. Well, for that one, I need I need water for that. Drink some water. I'm seeing a bunch of messages in Discord. Make sure, yeah, make sure you all tell me the uh, who you are so I can give you the points. Last day to redeem is today. No exceptions. After all, it's just extra credit. Okay, so for the ABL, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just throw in a bunch of numbers here. You know, why don't we use the weights as the numbers we're throwing in? No, because there's duplicates. I don't want to deal with duplicates right now. So let's just come up with random numbers. Three, five, one, two, eight, seven, six. Uh, not one there, maybe a nine. Okay, I don't think we have duplicates now. So, all right, let's just build the ABL tree and see what happens. You know, hopefully there's rotations. If not, we'll kind of add numbers to make rotations happen. So when there's nothing in your ABL tree, all you're gonna do is you're gonna throw a three. How do I redeem the 50.1? The same way you redeem the other ones. Just click on it and then if it asks you for text, then just fill whatever. I was experimenting to see if that text would allow me to have your name 
so that I don't have to have you message me on Discord. I'm not sure if it's anonymous though, so be aware of that. If you put your name in there and everybody sees it, then you're screwed. That's probably because you don't have enough points for it. It's only meant for when you can't redeem anything else. Maybe maybe it's sold out or whatever that thing is. Um, you can only do one redemption of that one. It's, you can only do one redemption to it. That's if if because you could because if you did two, that would be the same as a hundred. So I only let you do one of them. That's probably what it is. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and just throw things in. So three, okay. Um, well, I don't know then. One redemption forever. Well, probably because I only edited it today and I'm getting rid of it again. If I was to guess, so yeah, probably one redemption forever. So, yep, yeah, okay. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and insert the five. The five is greater than the three, so it is going to go to the right of the three. So, from there, we are going to go ahead and look at the next number. So, that's a one, so that's going to go to the left of the three. Again, remember binary search trees the left number is smaller than or equal to the number of the root, and the right child is always greater than the root. When we see a two there, the two is going to go to the right of the two because it is smaller than three, but it is greater than two. At this point is when things start to get interesting because the weights might be starting to be a common balance. If you want to keep track of it, remember you can put your little numbers here like this. You can put one there. And remember that the rule is that when the left root or the left the left subtree and the right subtree, when that difference is greater than one, then that's when you need to rotate. If it's equal to one, then you don't need to rotate. It's only when it's greater than one. It truly bothers me though. Green screen is doing weird things. It did fall earlier, so I probably. All right. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So, let's go ahead and throw in the eight because we're still balanced. So, if we throw in the eight, the eight is going to go over here. So, that is going to change the weights of this. And so now we have a one here and a zero here. This makes it become a two. This actually made it more balanced than before. All right. Let's throw in a seven. That is going to do good things. All right, so the 7 is going to go to the left of the 8, but to the right of the 5, because it's greater than 5, but smaller than the 8. So it goes here. Now let's notice what see what happens with the weight. Here we have 0, 0. Here we have 1, 0, 0. However, when we get to this level here, we are looking at a 2, 0. That difference is more than 1, and therefore we must perform a rotation. If you remember, there are four rotations. But really, it's just one rotation on the mirror of that. And then with the double rotations are just two of that rotation. So if you know one, you know them all. It's all about just kind of thinking about it. So let's just kind of step back a little bit from this example and look at the possible rotations. So the most popular rotation is we have something like this. Of course, you can see the balance here, 2, 0. And what you do is this becomes a new root. So this green one right here becomes a root in the middle. And then essentially, you know, if we, if we color code this correctly, Let's use that color for that one. And then let's use this color for this one. Then this will become basically this. Okay? So basically you take the middle one and you make it the root, and then the left child is still the left child, but the right child is now well, sorry, the right the parent is now becomes the right child, basically. Okay? So this is your most basic rotation, and then you can do the same thing but mirrored. This one I'm not gonna color code, but basically you go from here. To here as well okay just I'll just color code the middle one just so you know but yeah so this can be like you know one and five one and five and it's like a three okay so those are the single rotations those are easy the double rotations are a little bit more complicated and that's kind of when you have a situation like this if you try to do a single rotation with this what you would end up with would be just the mirror of it like that which does not solve the problem so what you do is you basically make a rotation between the child and the grandchild, which are basically these. What you want to do is you want to basically rotate that into this format here. If, and, and you can do this using the above rotations by having an imaginary node right here, which would end up here. And so if you want to do that so you can kind of feel safer about it, please do that. I, I know I did that when I was first learning ABLs. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's still useful to do. So you can keep track of things. But essentially, once you do it in this format, then you can just do the normal rotation and end up with this, which is exactly what we're just about to do here from the looks of it. So, uh, yeah. 
Essentially, uh, the other version of this is just the opposite. So when you have something like this, oh, that looks bad. Which again would just become first this, and then would become this, okay? So this becomes first this, and then of course you make your happy tree. All right, so that is the four rotations that you have. If you wanna go back to the video that I talked about this in the lecture, then you have the nice little like color-coded one that I made, right? So you can just take a screenshot of that, save it somewhere when you're taking the test. It's a good reference to have available. It's like a little cheat sheet. So yes, take advantage of that because you sure as heck don't get that when the class is in person again. So yeah, be fortunate. Okay. So in this case, let us go ahead and screw up because we don't know that it's a double rotation. So let's go ahead and perform a single rotation. So in this case, we try to perform the single rotation. So what we end up happening is we see that we have the five, the eight, and the seven, right? So we try to perform the single rotation, which means that the eight becomes the parent and the seven is the left child, still the left child as it was before, but the five gets moved. Uh, wait, sorry, no, 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 no screwed up in this case the five becomes a child and then the, the seven becomes the grandchild over here yes like that so you do that and you're like oh snap that did not help my problem so i am going to go ahead and give up on that one okay so now of course in the test you would do that you would say that it didn't fix the rotation and then you perform the double rotation okay make sure that you show the rotation on the exam don't just show the final tree that will not get you the points we were a little bit more flexible in the midterm we're not being flexible in the final okay so in this case, the first rotation you're going to do is you're going to make this be that. And then from there, the second rotation will, of course, be that. And so that basically solves our problem. So this whole thing becomes this thing. Okay. All right, we're done. At least with this step. The rest of the tree might be screwed up, but we don't know yet. But it's not. Turns out that everything is okay, as you can see there. Okay? All right. So I'm glad we saw a double rotation there, because that's really the example you need to see to make sure you understand what's happening. Let's continue. Let's go ahead and throw in the six in there. See if that makes anything scary. All right. So the six is going to go here. So that means that now we are looking at a one zero here. We're looking at a two one there, which is still okay. And here we're looking at a 3-2, which is actually okay as well, so we're safe. And then the 9 is going to go there, which is really just going to go ahead and change the uh, this thing from being a 0 to being a 1. So 0, 1. And then this between 2, 1 to 2, 2. But that, that's not going to change the rest. So there you go. We're done. Uh, let's just go ahead and throw in maybe uh, maybe one, one more number. Let's throw in another 3 in here, just for fun of it. If you throw another three in there, or here, let's throw in a 10 actually. Let's throw in a 10. So the 10 would go there, right? But this is of course going to get on balance here because this is gonna be a zero two. That is when you perform your rotation. This is just a single rotation. All that's gonna happen is the nine is gonna come up as a root and then the eight and the 10 are going to be its children. And just like that, you have a balanced tree, okay? Uh, I would recommend that you write the weights of the trees, but if you have all your rotations correct, then you don't have to draw the weights. But if you mess up the rotations, if you draw the weights, you'll get some partial credit. Okay. Uh, all right. I don't think there's any more questions on this one. Uh, my leg is falling asleep. Uh, okay. So what was the next thing that you guys wanted me to talk about? Obviously, this is not enough for you to learn this from scratch. So if you're still lost with this, that's when you want to go and watch the lecture again. Because that means you need, like, actual more, you know, you actually need to relearn the material. Which is okay if you forgot. But, you know, accept that, embrace it, resign from that, and then go and actually learn it, right? Okay, it doesn't seem that there's an additional questions on that. So are there any other topics, given... The the time constraints that you would like me to try and go over. This is a good review for me as well because I haven't seen some of these things since since I taught them. So I don't just keep this like super fresh. So it's 
it's nice to know that I have not forgotten. But I think at this point I've kind of hard memorized things like ABLs. Like I, I could probably come back in 10 years and I'm not even touching them and still do them. Things like Dijkstra's are the ones that I screw up because of the, I mix it with Pram, you know, that's like a memory thing. Quicksort is also one that I pretty much memorize by heart now. Heap sort. Pretty much most of them I have actually. But who knows? Memory is a funny thing. Ten years from now I could forget everything if I don't teach it again. So okay. So um I do see a bunch of people. I see twenty six. Twenty six, man. That's horrible. <laughs> if I see 300 pointers from somebody, then then I'm not going to be happy. Or if I see, you know, multiple 50s. Can you go over heap sort? I can try. I can definitely try. All right. So um, remember heap sort is the one that you sort in an array. And so let's just say we want to heap sort the numbers that we actually had earlier here. You know, it just seems like convenient to just use this list of numbers. So, remember the heap is, and this is the, hey, this is something that I don't remember fully, is the, I believe the heap is not the full binary tree, but the, the complete binary tree, I think. I think that's the one, complete, not perfect, but, but complete, excuse me. That's the one where like all the levels are full, except for the bottom level. And then the bottom level, it has to be leftmost, right? I believe that's, uh, oh, you can donate points? I didn't know that. That's, that's messed up. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's, that's, I think that's a complete, but don't quote me on that, because that's something that, that is something that I'm actually rusty. I'm really bad with names, actually. If anything, I'm bad with names. Like, I don't remember the guy who wrote the C++ language, even though I keep trying to remember it and I forget. Oh, what was his name? It's like John, maybe? Something? Let's see. Who wrote C++? Who wrote C++? Wait, no, that's not. Maybe I'm thinking of the C language. That's not the guy that I was thinking of. Then it's Richie. That's probably who I was thinking of. So that's C language, not C++. So, okay. Um, please don't pay money to get to get more points. That just seems unethical. <laughs> but, okay. Um, all right. So... Three, five, one, two, eight, seven, six, nine. So we are going to heap sort it, okay? And so what we first do is we're gonna build a heap out of that. Now it's already built because it's an array, but we want to visually see it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So this would essentially look like this. Three, five, one, two, eight, seven, six. Remember, it's basically the level order traversal and then nine, okay? Oh, where does that come from? Oh, shoot, that's the ABL stuff. Here, let's move this. We need the ABL stuff. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So, um, looking at this, what we're going to do is we're going to heapify it. This is going to take a while, guys. I'm warning you. This is, we're going over time with this one. Okay. So uh, we got to heapify this, then we got to heapify that, and then only after we do that, the next level is going to be to heapify this one, and then from there, the next level is going to be to be able to heapify that, and then we're going to be done. So it's going to be it's going to be quite a bit of work to get this done, but we will do our best. We're going to do a max heap actually, because if we do a max heap, we'll have the advantage that after we finish pulling things out from the heap, then it'll be in the correct order and not reversed. So yes, we're going to do that max heap. Should work. Should work. Okay. So because it is a max heap, that nine is going to be a, going to be going to the root, I bet. But let's go ahead and do it slowly. So the nine here and the two here, and we have finished the first triangle. And then we got one seven six. We got to pick the biggest one. So remember, you're always picking the biggest one. So here's a seven, and here's a one. And then uh, here we got five nine and eight. So we're going to pick the biggest one. In this case, it's the nine again. So five and nine flip. However, because it's flipped. We need to recheck this bottom one. It turned out that it's okay right now, but it might have not have been because there could have been a one there, for example, and that would have broken it. 
So whenever you're doing this bubbling up or bubbling down situation, you need to check what it affected. You don't need to check anything over here because nothing changed there. But because this changed, you got to recheck that triangle, okay? So, you know, get your Sharpies and color-coded things. If, you, if you're doing this in person, I would recommend that. But here digitally, I guess, get your paint skills going or your tablet if you have one. Uh, all right. So anyways, that takes care of the green and blue sets of triangles. So now we go for the red one. The red one, we picked the biggest one. The, the nine is the biggest one. So we're going to swap the nine and the three. And because this swap, we got to recheck the green one. And as you can see, it is indeed messed up because now we got to swap them. We got to swap the five, the three and the eight here. Like that. Okay. And now we don't need to check anything else because there's no child of that. So we are good to go. We have finished the heapify stage. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the max key a lot of times and then the, the thing will sort itself okay so the way we remove things from the heap is we replace it with the last item in the heap so in this case we're going to replace the nine with the two down here so the nine is going to go there and the two is going to go there after you do that replacement then you got to bubble it down to the right spot which means you just fix the heap essentially so how do we fix the heap we'll fix the red triangle the red triangle says that uh eight should go on the top right so we're going to swap the two and the eight and then because we swapped that, we got to verify the green triangle. It is indeed true that the green triangle got messed up. So we are going to swap the two and the five. And now the green triangle is messed up. Now you might be like, well, let's fix this now. Wait a second. When we did that swap and we swapped the nine and the two, we also mark that this part of the heap is no longer there. You know, how do we do that in code? Just, you know, keep a little top index called top or end and just have that point to the last valid spot in the heap. In this case, it would be the six. So that's how you make sure you don't accidentally keep swapping things around and the whole thing will break. You'll, you'll, you'll loop forever, infinite loops. You know, we talked about the side of Italy problem. You want to go down that dark path. Okay. All right. Now we got to do this again about two, four, six, seven times. So I'm going to talk a little bit less, do a little more. Otherwise, we'll never be done. Okay. So swap the eight and the last number. So that's a six. So six and the eight. Come on, do the eight properly. There we go. Market is done, so we don't swap it by accident. Fix the heap. So swap the six and the seven. Thank, thank you that it swapped there, because that means uh, we only got to do no more swaps. So we're, we're done with that. GG's. All right, swap the next one. So seven and one. Mark that is done. Okay, now fix the heap. All right, the one is going to swap with the six. Also happy about that. Because we are also nothing to do anymore. Because now there's nothing you can swap it with. So we're good. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy these numbers are working our way. Today is a lucky day with this. Or at least my lucky day. So now we go and swap this again. So 6 is going to go here. And the 3 is going to go there. And then um, mark the 6 is done. And then fix it. So this is going to go with a 5. Because that's the biggest one of the numbers. 5, 3. Now we got to check the green one in this case. And uh, three to two, that's okay. So no more swap there. Okay, moving on to the next one. Swap the five and the two. Mark the five as done. Fix the heap. In this case, the three has to swap with the two. All right, we're good to go. Now I'll do the same thing again. So we're gonna swap the three with the one and mark the three as done. Fix the heap. Heat fixed, and then we're good. All right, now last one. Swap the one and the two again. I know this looks repetitive, but it's the way the algorithm works. So just don't question it, embrace it. All right, done with that. Finally, we swap the one with itself and then fix the heap, which is just a single item. So we just marked that as done. We're good. Let's look at the level of traversal, which is how this thing is being stored. Well, if we look at it, it has a one, a two, a three, a five, a six, a seven, an eight, and a nine, which means that that's how the area is stored, which means that we have indeed completed the heap sort algorithm. Yes. So that's a fancy one, right? That's probably the fanciest one we learned for sorting. Man, yeah, quick sort is pretty cool too, but heap sort has a certain elegance to it. And of course, we like to see that O n log n for the time complexity, right? And for space complexity, it's also pretty good. Also, uh, you can do a little bit of parallelizing with this stuff because when you're fixing the heap, but it's not very parallelizable. Um, yeah, that's the one downside of it. 
Mercer's like the, the, the embarrassingly, embarrassingly parallelizable one that you can just like distribute amongst a billion computers and sort the universe pretty fast or something. All right. And log in time, but still. Okay. Now, I did, uh, is there anything else? I mean, well, actually, we're out of time, though. So if there's any quick questions, I can answer. Because, I mean, we can go on forever for this stuff. App, at? I don't know what the app means. But, uh... All right then. Well, now's your the last few seconds you have left to redeem before we end the stream. I will go ahead and claim. If you don't message me within the next twenty minutes for the for the extra credit, who you are, then I'm not gonna know, and then you won't get the points. So make sure you get them in. So all right then. Well, thank you guys. Thank you all. Uh, you should be able to see the results for the. Uh, for the for the extra credit, I'm oh, sorry for the, for the uh, a bet. I believe I decided to show the answers today after class. So I don't know why it's not letting you do the thing with the 50 points. But you did redeem earlier, so that might have been one. But all right then, thank you all for a wonderful semester. It was fun. You know, we we covered a lot. Some things we didn't cover. Some things we did. I think that overall, you guys will be covered. I think we, we did a good job on, but that's up to you to decide. And uh, I wish you all to have a wonderful winter break. And uh, thank you all for sticking around. For those of you that watch the live lectures, it's always good to talk to somebody when, I, when you're teaching, you know, versus just talking to the, to the, to the wall behind me, I guess. But uh, I do wish you the best of luck with your final. Do you do good on that? I'm not going anywhere. I mean, I'm, I'll be on Discord and... You know, I welcome you guys to stop by my office, you know, next semester. Well, not next semester because we're still like this, but probably in the fall of next year when I assume things will be back more in person. But, you know, it's an assumption at the end of the day. But uh, I am optimistic about that. So have a good winter break. Stay safe, everybody. Do good in the test. And uh, I'll see you around. I'll be around, okay? So there's the dab. Okay, CS3 one is not hard at all. So you can watch the YouTube videos already for that one. But uh, all right then. I don't have my, my puppy with me to, uh, to say goodbye, but uh, she wishes you all very well, as you can see from the picture. All right. So uh, yes, 301 is easy, but uh, it's, it's full already. So yes, message me on Discord or email, all right? Okay then. Well, this is it. The last video. This is my last class too, so this is it. I'm not not doing any more videos until January. So, cool. All right then. Have a good break. Good luck, everybody. See you soon. Stay safe.